Here's what we're doing today. We are moving from unit two to unit three, right? Um, we're gonna start on the third paper, we're gonna talk about the problem, all that fun stuff, but I'd like to illustrate for you just at the beginning because sometimes there's confusion. I also don't like to give it away for free. Uh, this is where we're at. Research paper, uh, it's gonna be organized the same as all the other units. You have your prompts and whatnot up here. Uh, we're talking about, it feels like a lot up top, but it's all super spaced out. It's not, okay, it's gonna be okay. Under that you have videos, we're making one now. And then below that you have your homework, same as always, uh, chronologically organized. Right. Anyway, let's talk about the prompts. To begin with, the source text, Die Hard, the film. I'm hoping against hope you've watched it before today. I know some of you haven't, just statistically speaking. I will say this, this class will be weird if you haven't seen the movie, okay? Uh, this paper will be impossible if you don't watch it at some point. You gotta write about the movie. And, and look, man, I, it's a movie, it's a movie. Sometimes I'll have people complain that it's like two hours long and then I will counter with it's a movie. Make it happen. Uh, length, it's five pages. I know you guys are gonna bristle at that. I would sell it to you like this. Hopefully you just turned in a paper for me, which is four pages, or at least close, because that's the requirement. This paper asks a little bit more of you, all right? There's a research component, uh, but there's also uh, this other element, I'm gonna bring up in a second, that you have to provide yourself. What I'm telling you is, Generally speaking, for this paper, people don't struggle with the five pages. You can do it. It won't be fun, okay, but you can do it. Um, percentage is 30%. You are allowed to be worried about that. That is significant, 30% of your grade. That's not nothing. Um, but here again, uh, to skip ahead a little bit because it's MLA, obviously it's MLA. I'm not even gonna cover that. It's due the 16th of November. Today's the 20th of October, so it's a little less than a month to get the paper written. And again, I'll put it to you like this. We spend longer on paper two, but that's because I gotta give you guys like two weeks or whatever to read a novel. Hopefully you've watched the movie, so you're done with the text. And again, even if you haven't watched it yet for some fucking reason, you will. You'll watch that movie and you'll, in an afternoon and you'll be done with it. And then you can immediately launch into the paper writing process. So pretty much, from here until the 16th is all talking about the movie, thinking about the movie, we're gonna do research at some point, and then you're gonna write a paper. You have plenty of time to make these five pages appear. Okay. What the assignment is, there's a whole lot of words here I'm never gonna read at you. Basically, <clears throat> I have two ways of describing it. I'm gonna try them both on you, okay? Number one is, it's essentially a combination of papers one and two, okay? Paper one, if you recall, uh, you, you picked the text and you had to analyze it, build some kind of an argument using that text. What does old men playing basketball, for instance, say about us as a people, a society, a culture, when it comes to how we view the world, what we expect out of certain people, right? You're making that kind of an argument about Die Hard. The difference to bring in paper two is there's research involved. So you're gonna go find other articles, just like you did on paper two. Uh, the, the difference there would be, instead of this person says this, this person says this, this is where they agree, all that jazz. Now you're just using those articles in service of your argument. This brings in the other way I explain this paper. I hope this works. Paper two is like Destiny's Child. Is everyone familiar somewhat with what that is? Paper three, you're Beyonce. Your argument is what matters. You're gonna have backup singers, and they help. They are not the star of the show. Your ideas govern the entire paper, okay? Does all that make some kind of sense? Great. Um, source requirements, it's five to seven sources. One of those is the, is the movie, to be clear, okay? So we're really talking four articles. And again, you're writing me five pages. You're gonna be happy to have four articles. We're gonna do bibs again. I know you're looking forward to that. Um, 
for the bibs, uh, I want to make sure I'm clear and I'll remind you when we get there. You're not writing a bib this time about Die Hard. We have a different assignment for that. Your bibs this time are only for secondary sources, so for articles, what have you. And again, it's my hope you'll be happy to have them when it comes time to write the paper. Questions at this stage? I got one more thing to say. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, I have a suggested thesis here. I hate doing this, uh, but this suggested thesis isn't great, so um, it's right here in the middle. You could say a thing like, a lumberjack is the best representation of contemporary masculinity. The reason I like this suggested thesis is structurally it's what we're after. When I tell you guys, what does Die Hard, came out in 1988, I know it's kind of old, uh, it's two years younger than me. So it's not that old. Um, what does it say about us as a people, a society, a culture? The very tip of the iceberg in terms of what that means is, for instance, how is John McClane an example of contemporary masculinity? What does the way this character is presented on screen, what does it tell us about our expectations when it comes to masculinity or our expectations when it comes to sort of different relationships between different kinds of people, anything like this. You guys are freaking me out, okay. You're allowed, I was like, what's happening? Um, does that make a little bit of sense? Okay, it should hopefully make more sense by the end of today, but that's the gist of the assignment. Composing some kind of an argument about the movie backing that up with research, which again, we'll talk about here in a couple classes, and you do that for five pages. Cool, all right. Now what we're gonna do, and I am mad sweating this, I don't know how this is gonna look. I am concerned. All right. All I'm interested in today, I also don't know if this will autoplay when I back up. Let's line up. Cool. Um, okay. So I don't forget, we're going to watch from the beginning of the movie. We're going to go through as many scenes as we can, given the time we have. Honestly, we might get like 15 minutes into the film with the kind of analysis we're going to uh, attempt today. Okay? My goal is this. All I want you to realize by the end of today, uh, given the scenes we're going to look at, number one, you can do the kind of work we're looking to do with any scene, honestly. Um, at least in good films, any scene you can pick apart, you can think about significant details. If you think about how we talked about Vonnegut there for those two weeks, we would look at different paragraphs, uh, we would pull out different quotations, right? You can do the same kind of work with a movie. Of course, you can quote characters, but it's also visual. I want to remind you of this. So if you see something on screen, or if uh, the music is interesting for some kind of a reason that strikes you, right? Anything at all that could potentially be interesting. You don't even have to know why right now, but you're like, well, that that's kind of weird, right? Like anything at all. We're trying to build an inventory today of possibilities, essentially. Okay. Um, the other thing I will tell you, the movie's real loud at the start. It's an airplane. Airplanes are loud. I'm not so worried about us because we know it's coming. They don't. Um, it'll get quieter after that, but I'm a little bit anxious about it because she's trying to teach and she's nice. But that's just, that's, I didn't, I didn't decide that there should be windows. So anyway. Uh, as I said, we're going to watch this first scene uh, right from the beginning of the film. Uh, there, there's a plane coming in. We get the title of the movie. We're going to be introduced to John McClane. And we don't necessarily know it yet, uh, watching the movie for the first time, although it's probably pretty clear he's the main character, right? Um, but I want you to think about in this first scene especially the choices they make. So the, what I mean by that is the director, first of all, crushed this movie, I feel like. Um, but every choice they make, everything that's on screen, they edit that, they shoot it a million times, like these are decisions people make, okay? So it's intentional. 
And one, the only directive I would give you for this first scene is, do you notice anything that gets highlighted? Or do, you, do any details jump out that maybe they're trying to tell you something about this character? Because that's probably important. That's probably intentional. All right, here we go. I'm also gonna turn this up just a little bit. Well, I'm gonna try. I'm curious. Do you guys notice anything there in that first watch? Anything stand out to you? Fish with your toes, that's weird. That's kind of a, an upper tier detail that we can for sure talk about. Does anybody? Like, it passes our first test, which is, that's a damn weird thing to say to a person, right? What do you think, what do you guys think that's about? Like, for instance, the first question we could ask, pretty easy question, why, we'll call him the businessman, the guy next to him. Why does he say that to McLean? Do you think? Yeah. Ah, so we're gonna take, we, uh, we need to talk about that too, but let's, let's put that down for a second. But yeah, we need to talk about that. So he realizes McLean is nervous. He offers him advice. He tells us he's experienced. He said he's been doing it for nine years, right? From the businessman's perspective, what's he trying to do for McLean? I think he's trying to do a thing. Pretty, pretty easy to see. Advice. Trying to help him out, yeah. Like, hey man, you seem new, you seem nervous. This helps me, right? How does McLean respond to that? Because that's interesting too. How do you guys read his response? Fist with your toes, he says. A little confused, which again, it's an odd thing to say. I'm a little annoyed. It does kind of register as maybe not happy to be having this conversation. Yeah. And yeah. And again, there's different ways to read that. And pretty much any time I say that, what I'm indicating to you is we could start to consider different arguments, right? Some of them are, are banal. For instance, maybe McLean just doesn't want to be bothered, especially on an airplane. And it's like, well, yeah, that's all of us. I don't want people talking to me, right? Um, well, let's push past those if we can, and let's consider, like we're just throwing out theories, hypotheticals. We're gonna have to back up a little bit to that initial piece of evidence. I don't know if you guys caught it. I could probably get it on the screen. All right. This is our introduction to the character. This is the first thing we see of John McClane. And immediately, like two seconds in, you're like, He's gonna tear that damn armrest off. So it tells you what about him? He's a nervous liar. I'd, I'd, go, I'd go further than nervous. Terrible. He's fucking terrified. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. This is gonna be the action hero, right? Like this is gonna be the guy that takes out X amount of terrorists, right? And, and all this stuff. And your introduction is, oh, but he's scared to fly. What about that? I'm telling you that's interesting. I hope you agree. What's potentially interesting about introducing our hero in that way? Yeah. He's, he's mortal, right? Like he's more human. Being afraid to fly is a human thing. Relatable. Sure. And you may not be afraid, but you're afraid of things. You know, like, yeah, and, it, and I can't stress this enough, uh, you guys may not realize this, 1988 is kind of the height, well, actually, a little bit toward the end, but big time action heroes, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, steroids are free type of movies, right, like, and those guys don't have weaknesses, like, they're, they're much more similar to our superhero films now, right, um, it's almost like they have powers and they're damn sure not afraid to fly, right? But at the very beginning of the movie, uh, before we even get dialogue, they're showing you he has this human weakness to him. Feels intentional. 
Also, there's one other element I want to, and again, I'm a little worried about the screen. Do you guys see anything else that's kind of interesting? Wedding ring. Ah, he's married. The two things we know about him from the jump, he's scared and he's married. Again, that feels intentional. In some kind of a way, it must matter that he's a family man, which we don't know he has a family yet, but we also find out in this scene it's pretty clear that he has a family. Does anybody know why that is? The huge fucking teddy bear. That's probably not his, right? Yeah. So much of this scene wants you to know that he's human, but he's a, also a dad. That's interesting. It's way too early in the film to necessarily make an argument about that. But also because it's so early in the film, if I was taking notes, I'd be, I'd be like, what, what's this all this? Why does it want us to know he's married, he has kids? What's that about? That's a concern the film has, okay? Now, we can get all the way back to the businessman. He sees this too. Uh, I'm not going to play the scene again and watch you guys watch me struggle with it. But he looks at his hand is what happens. The businessman goes, hey, flying, right? Or whatever he says. So now we could hypothesize, why do you think, why could you argue McLean is annoyed when the businessman offers that advice? Other than it, it's weird, because it is, it is weird. He doesn't say much after he says that. He's not a big talker, so early in the film at least. He's uh, reserved, you might say, like closed off. Yeah. Now we could argue there's reasons for that too. But let's, let's push on this some. Like we said before, the hand, it tells us as an audience, like weakness, right? And now we're saying, well, the businessman sees that. Kind of, you kind of have to do that when you offer help. Do you have a hand as well? Yeah. Go, go ahead. Maybe if I was trying to like emasculate him, because when he gets up and he says like the whole, when he sees the gun, it's like, yeah, I've been doing this for 11 years. So like it shows like he's humble. Because he could have said something right then and there, like to shut it down. He's not trying to like emasculate him. And then when he sees the gun, he's like all shocked. Like, oh. Well, no, no, I mean, the gun is going to be, all right, so let's slow down a little. You, you went a little fast. So to begin with, I don't know that we could say the businessman is trying to emasculate him. But what we can say is that he does. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, like we, we can't really say why the businessman says that. You could easily argue he's just trying to help a guy you know but our argument begins with he for damn sure kind of does emasculate him he notes McLean's weakness which it seems pretty clear he's trying to keep to himself this is this is a secret between him and the armrest right but the guy sees it and you could argue McLean doesn't like that and all of a sudden now we're talking about he's he's defending his masculinity here. How dare you note my my fear to fly, right? I don't want your fucking advice. I don't need your advice. You could argue a little bit, right? That's interesting too. That he would feel like he has to defend his masculinity, right, in this moment. Beyond that, there is the and again this was the '80s. I guess it was allowed. He has a gun on the plane. And the dude rightfully goes, uh, like I love how you see his face for a hot minute. He's like, what? Uh, uh, uh. Um, why do we see the businessman's face like that? There's confusion, but there's other things too. What's on his face there? For sure. For sure. Dude with a gun on a plane, been sitting to next to you the whole time. Yeah. What's that about, given everything we've just said about this first scene? Why why do they want us to see the businessman afraid here? Kind of like what she was saying, it kind of gives power back to uh, Sean. Good. Kind of gives him one up. It emasculates him now. Um, so there's a couple things we can talk about. For one, we've absolutely identified almost like, I mean, you guys are talking about power, which is true. Like who has power in this scenario? Uh, first is the businessman because he has like this experience and he offers advice, but now it's McLean because he had a gun and that kind of trumps all that shit, right? Um, 
and he mentions he has experience like i've been doing this for 11 years it's a nice little callback yes but we're also saying in this in this specific scene fear is a kind of currency weakness whoever's weak is not the one in power right like you you lose your position in the in the kind of setup we're describing right in this first scene and it doesn't it doesn't seem like anyone is doing it intentionally i want to underscore that because i have students sometimes say mclean intentionally flashes his gun i don't read it that he just has it right and the guy sees it and all of a sudden now mclean so what we could argue is how power works in this scene what that has to do with who is seen as more masculine because it does seem to come down to who has power right all that is going on we're not even two minutes into the movie right there's a couple other things in this scene we mentioned the bear that's pretty clearly hey he's a dad too uh and again there's not a lot we can say about it in this scene other than it seems important in the film they want you to know right there's another thing and i'm kind of curious if you guys caught it happens right at the end of this scene The flight lady. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was remembering another time you messed up a word uh, that we can't say. Um, stewardess, flight attendant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's what's the deal with the the stewardess at McLean? What happens? She looks at him weird. She looks at him weird. I I don't think it's the bear, man. It's it. She checks him out. There's a. And I can try. Oh God. His reactions here. Well, let's talk about her first. I think she's checking him out. And again, this is a decision. This was scripted. Why? Why do you think they they basically make sure to get that into the end of the scene? Like, oh yeah, so the stewardess has to check him out. Why? Oh, no, you're trying way too hard. You're trying way too hard. Hold on. Pause the brakes. Pause the brakes. Yes. What if, like, he just did that masculine thing about the gun? Yeah. Usually, like, in, like, the real world, a lot of people, like, you know, like, girls have guns. You know what I mean? So, like, they show, like, girls find that attractive, maybe. And well, then all of a sudden, after that happens, she has to, like, check it out. Yeah, I mean, we... Uh, to make sure I'm clear, with what there's nothing that indicates to us that, like, she sees the gun. Okay, but the rest of what you're saying, I think is the point. Again, bear in mind, I keep saying this is our introduction to the character, right? So he's married, he's scared, he's dad, and the ladies love him. He's hot stuff. They want you to know. We haven't even gotten his name yet. But these are the things, these are the qualities the, the, the director wants you to know about the main character. This is our hero. I would argue, I think, this is kind of a laundry list in this very first scene of defining masculine characteristics. Yeah? He's, he, he shows weakness, which is interesting. We'd absolutely have to look at that through the rest of the movie. But he can also take the power back, right? He's not weak the whole time. Um, he's doing his job as a family man and that's a whole other thing that we're for damn sure gonna have to talk about but but if he wanted and he wouldn't want to because that would be wrong but if he wanted to he could throw down he's got options right they make sure to indicate that to you which is interesting i love as well uh did you guys catch his reaction like he does a double take and then I don't, did you see his face? It's, yeah, but then when he's leaving the, the plane, he's like, what? He gives you one of the, the eyebrow things, like the, what the fuck was that? Which I love too. So he's, he's, how do you guys read that? Like the, the, like the way I read it to begin with, he does a double take, like did that just happen type of moment? And then the look on his face is one of, uh, I would describe it as confusion, almost. What is that about, do you think? 
We're supposed to see him as sexually viable, but then his reaction is weird to me. I think that's like since he's been married, probably for a while since he has kids. Yeah. Been like, oh, I still got it. Like, I don't. Maybe I'm still, maybe I'm still, I still have a chance. Okay. It's gonna be real quick. <laughs> Like, I don't think he knows what to do with that. What is that about? I don't, we need to move on, but like the point I want to stress is, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what to do with that moment. I normally don't talk about it, but for some reason I wanted to with you guys. It's weird. All the things we just said about this guy, and then at the very end to be like, but he could also fuck people, right? But he, he's not comfortable with that idea. It's weird. Okay. Next scene. Um, again, we're just going to go straight through the first couple scenes of the film. This is, he's off the plane now, clearly. He's going to walk through the terminal. He's going to light a cigarette because 80s. Um, we're going to meet Argyle, who honestly is my favorite character in the movie. Uh, we don't usually get to talk about it very much. But again, same rules apply. Do you notice anything? Uh, there's a whole lot happening in this scene, by the way. Um, things people say, things people do, you get it. Here we go. So again, I wanna open the floor to you guys. Anything you notice, anything stand out to you? I'm just looking at the couple that... Ah, well, let's be specific. He doesn't start by looking at the couple. What's he looking at? Her ex. That is what happens. He's not, he's not, he couldn't pick her face out of the lineup. He's not doing one of these. He's doing one of these. And he does one of those, right? He, he follows it. This occurs not two minutes probably after the stewardess interaction, right? What is this? We just had a moment where he was like, I don't know what to do with that shit, right? But now he's off the plane, he's got a cigarette, and he's like, ass. What is, what is that, do you think? Yeah, confidence boost, maybe. Maybe. There's some element of, well, ooh, I don't want to give you too much. Normally, I would say no to that, because it feels banal, but I think there actually could be a good, why do you think he might be feeling himself a little bit? Oh, uh, well, the girl. Well, maybe he's had time since getting off the plane to the terminal to be like, oh, maybe that girl was actually like, you know, maybe she was into me. Maybe I yeah, her. I mean, it, 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 maybe. I think there's a stronger, like a, a much easier reason to argue. For the sake of time, where does his exchange with the stewardess occur? On the plane where he's scared. He's scared. He's scared and now people are looking at me and what the hell's going on, right? But now he's on the ground. He has a cigarette. He's much more in his element. Ass. I mostly just love saying that. But, yeah. But here's, here's what's interesting to me. Again, consider what we're kind of saying. When he's on the plane, even though he takes the power back, which, which he does, generally, in that environment, I think you could pretty easily argue he's weakened, right? Like, he's not confident. He's not himself really the question is what is and i hate this is cheesy but like what is the real john mcclain is it the weakened version that we see on the plane where we see this like human moment that he has or is the real john mcclain because this is the question the film has kind of given you the ass guy right which one's real and which one potentially is a bit of an act even unconsciously. Do you see my point? I don't think it's an accident that this occurs right after the stewardess exchange, right? Where he doesn't know how to handle it. But here, he pretty blatantly objectifies this woman. Okay? There's gotta be a reason for that. An addendum to that observation, by the way, he doesn't just 
track her ass, even though he does that. What happens as he follows this this woman? What occurs right after that? Yeah, like we're gonna uh, an aggressive hug, we'll say. How else would we describe that hug if you were writing about it in a paper? We have to describe it. What kind of hug is that? Slightly inappropriate. Suggestive. It's a suggestive hug. Right? At least in the context of the film, given that he objectifies her all the way up to that hug, it's pretty suggestive. What does McLean say? He says one word. California. And he says it in that McLean kind of way, right? Like, California. What does that mean? Other than, I guess that's where we are, right? What do you think he means by that? And you might have to depend a little bit upon what you learn about McLean later. Like, he's from New York, all that stuff. Like, kind of like, full of, like, implements and, like, guns and, like, It's full of people just suggestively hugging all over the place, right? We kind of talk about this in beauty, and I know we didn't, we didn't get to talk about it in class, but if you remember the two guys from that poem are from Hollywood, they're from California, and there, there, is, there is such a thing as regional stereotypes. You guys are probably familiar with some of these. So for instance, McLean is from New York, and he's a cop. We have some assumptions, we do, even now, we have some assumptions about those kinds of people, right? And it's weirdly linked to climate a lot of the time for some reason. Like it's cold there, so people are cold there, you know what I'm saying? As opposed to California is much freer and people just leap into each other's arms and shit. Just, you know, all the time. Why do you think he says it with that tone? California. Like what, what is he, what are we learning about this character in that moment? Do you think? He seems to look down upon it, or again, at the very uh, look down upon the idea of it, right? This the stereotype, yeah. And it's that freedom that we're talking about, that sexual freedom, that gets lumped into that stereotype. He's looking down upon it. I'm better than that. That's ridiculous. Part of it, he's already doing like the show theater. Very good, actually. Very astute observation. So much of the movie. I was gonna get to this later, and we will. But especially the first half hour is John McClane being super uncomfortable. He's obviously not comfortable on the plane. You kind of realize he's not comfortable being in this state. Um, he's not comfortable here. We cut to the next scene, and we're gonna watch the scene. But like, that's not where you sit in the limo if you're cool with being in a limo, right? He's not comfortable ever. Um, and of course we have to push on that. We have to define, first of all, what that discomfort is and why he's uncomfortable. But yeah, when it comes to California itself, the idea of it, he doesn't like being there. Which is interesting. Maybe. But like, like if we think about his character, I and mean, I don't know if we can do it at this stage, so again, I was planning on doing it later, but you made an astute observation. What I'll say now is and hopefully we can build to it. I think there's an argument there. The fact that he's uncomfortable. Like not just he doesn't like it and he's an asshole because he is doing that, but I think it goes deeper. I think there's something going on and he's, he doesn't feel right being here. And we would have to think about why that is. Okay. Anything else from the, the scene we just watched? There's a couple other things, but I, I just want to see what you guys noticed. No, but you can absolutely talk about it because it's a pretty big moment. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, based off the phone call with the man, he's yeah. like, um, he needs to, well, for the character development, just my experience, as someone who work, associated like, with the officer, or putting down the phone because he didn't even call yet. It just seems like he's like a family man, but not really. Like, he's, not in the family. he's like absent in some way that's pretty significant for sure. And you, and you find out that's made even worse by he's literally absent. Right there in California, and he is not. He's about as far away as you can be and still be in the same country. Um, I love all the windows in this room. Sorry. Um, There's also a point made in the movie where um, I 
think it's that guy that talks about Argyle. Yeah. Yeah. Talks about where he's from and versus where she lives at, and pretty much it might not be him, but questioning why he doesn't live in the same state as her. Oh, that, that that's gonna happen here in a second. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but that's important for sure. Um, well, the other thing I would say really quickly, what's also interesting about the, the moment you're talking about, Holly, and we're not going to talk about her today, we just don't, but we're going to talk about her a lot to, uh, next time, um, catches some flack sometimes for, for being this maternal figure who's also pretty clearly consumed with work, right? Like it's the holidays, it's, it may even be, I think it's Christmas Eve, I believe it's Christmas Eve, um, and she's not home, right? Now, later in the film, she's not not home by choice, but she's still at work. She's talking to her nanny, who's like taking care of the kids, and you're like, well, you're kind of falling down on the job too in some ways. Like, so what are we saying about motherhood here? Like, there's something going on there. But absolutely, um, McLean does not look good as that family man. We were just told that he is. Like, he's he's uh, the, the way we talked about it before a month or two months ago, he's kind of falling down on the job. There's all these boxes you gotta check. And if you're a dad, if you're a family man, there, there's certain boxes you gotta check. And he's missing on those, it seems like. All right. The other things I would point out from the scene before we get into this one, uh, as I said, we meet Argyle, um, which I always forget. That's like a, is that a, a pattern of fabric is what Argyle is? Does anybody know? Yes. Okay, I mean, so, but the point there is, it's kind of a weird name. He's kind of a weird character. No one else in the movie is like this guy. Um, and we don't, we don't get to talk about him very much, unfortunately, but the point I would make to you is, I would argue he's different for significant reasons. I don't think it's an accident that Argyle kind of stands out um, in some ways that are important. Um, but I love, in this scene, it's immediate, right? When he's talking to McLean, um, he takes off his sunglasses and says, I was hoping you would know it's my first time driving a limo. What is that? Taking off his sunglasses and saying that. What's he what's he doing there? Vulnerability maybe. For sure. And it's a, I mean it's such a it's such a tell um, to take off the sunglasses, right? They're 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 a nice little barrier, you can't see his eyes, so it's less personal. But he he's like, hey man, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I was hoping you did. Yeah? Like a man that's up less cold two times. Yeah, yeah. Because well, like he wants to indicate to McLean, but for our purposes, to us, right? I'm going to make myself vulnerable here. Um, we don't have to worry about any of that man shit. You know, just like, hey man, I need help. I'm going to make myself weak here. Yeah. Like pretty much he stepped out from, the, like he, he didn't know who he was expecting to see. Yeah. So like he wanted to come like put himself up there and then when he realized who he was picking up, he was like, I'm gonna step down from the level I was at. That's an interesting argument I hadn't considered. That he kinda sizes up McLean who admittedly doesn't look like much uh in, in his outfit. Yeah, maybe so. Especially if he's at the airport in a limo, first time, you see where they're going. He could rightfully assume he's gonna pick up some like hotshot guy, well dressed, all that stuff, and then and then he sees McLean and he's like, Oh. You wanna brush that or anything? Right? Yeah, so yeah, maybe. Maybe he kind of registers McLean isn't what he thought. But that also pretty clearly allows them like they they ought they they're on the same level, these guys. Which we're gonna talk about in this next scene. Uh, but it starts in the previous scene when he says, I've never driven a limo before. And McLean says, ah, it's all right, I've never ridden one, right? What does it mean to ride in a limo? Yeah. yeah. Or at the very least, just splurged, right? Maybe you guys have like prom night associations, right? But um, because Argyle then says, you know, I used to drive a cab. What's the difference between a limo and a cab? They're cheaper. They're for normal people. And you're not, I mean, if you're in a limo too, you're normally going to some kind of event, right? Cab, 
You might you might be going to work or something, right? That's, that's not. Yeah. So it's a very uh, you'll hear this term a lot. Every man sort of occupation, not corporate America, not moneyed. Questions about financial situations going to come in at this stage. Um, much more kind of lower down the totem pole type of deal. All right. Next scene. Uh, oh, I have no clock whatsoever, by the way. What time is it? 11.42. Okay. Ooh. All right. Um, they're going to be in the limo. They're going to chat. They're going to. Um, did they just turn on the light? Yeah. It's just, we got, we turned it off. Well, no, there's those, but I think those were off, and now they're on. Anyway, um, they're going to chat. They're going to talk about what you kind of referenced, which is, what are you doing here? And we're, we're going to see how that goes. I'm actually going to stop midway through this scene. Um, I would hope it's pretty obvious, but I'll, you know, I'll ask anyway. What strikes you from this exchange? This scene's pretty much all conversation. I mean, there's a couple of visual items, but... Who's he? Uh, okay, just because we have two of them. So. Yeah. He seems like he's not happy in this relationship. Like he asked if he, um, Argyle asked if he's married, and he said, like he was just like, yeah. Like, yeah. He well, and he's got some of those defenses up, like we talked about before. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't trying to cut you off. I just. No, you're good. Okay. okay. Well, yeah. I mean, and and again, we learn what we already know. There's trouble in paradise with Holly fucking slamming the, the frame there. Um, but we learn a little bit here, right? This is kind of letting us into uh, what that trouble is. What is the trouble? Huh? He got a good job and he didn't think that he'd be able to keep up with like the bigger city police department. Well, I, it's mostly that second thing. Again, we're going to double down on there's something about this state, the life it would ask him to live, that makes him deeply uncomfortable. Okay? And I stress that. There's got to be a better word. Maybe we'll arrive at it. It's more than being uncomfortable. But that's where we're going to, that's where we're at right now. Initially, he kind of lies to Argyle, right? We find that out. Argyle says, uh, why don't you move out here? And then McLean says, I'm a New York City cop, got a six month back. Like, he's, if he's ever got that tone, it normally only exists in the beginning of the film. You pretty much know he's putting on a front, right? He's playing the character of New York City cop. And then Argyle calls him on it immediately. What does Argyle say? This is important. Oh, he says one thing in particular that's very important. No one asked if he was married, separated. Well, right, so there's two, but that that was not as important. Yeah, yeah. He said something about her, like, or something. Like, yes, but how does he put it? Does anybody remember? Like, what's the plan of him moving with her? There, but yeah, but he says something right before that. Exactly. Okay, let's watch it. What does he say? Yeah, but what does he say? He says she's going to fail, but how does he say it? Crawling back. Crawling back. That is a, that is a certain way to put that. What, what does it mean to put it that way? What is Argyle indicating about uh, McLean's desires? He's saying McLean wanted something to happen, hoped something would happen, hoped she would fail. Yes. But he says it in a specific way. What does it mean to come crawling back? To meet him desperate. Ah, both of those things. So what are we talking about? Power. Power. Who has it? She does. The implication seems to be her. Uh, but Argyle is saying, but you wanted it to be not just her to fail so spectacularly that she would need you, maybe a bit of desperation, and you would get the power back. Which of course tells us. I mean, again, where she's working, the life she seems to have, she's living in LA on her own money. I mean, I'm sure he helps, you know, but 
she's probably doing all right. She seems to be doing pretty okay. She seems like she doesn't need him. I don't think he likes that. Right? We'll try it for just a second, but for the sake of time, if we, if we can't sort it out, it's okay. We'll, we'll sort it out later. Why do you think that bothers him? Yeah. Well, he's not present. And again, but we've even we've gone further and said he's not necessary. He hasn't been present for six months, and they seem fine. That is a huge knock against his sort of stereotypical manhood, right? I'm sure he does all right as a New York City cop, but he's not pulling in whatever she is. If she's making more, we're talking about power, she seems to have it, at least financially. That makes him, as we've said many times, uncomfortable. And Argyle knows it immediately, right? Laughs at him about it. The other thing he says, we can talk about this for just a second. Uh, he makes a joke before that, Argyle does. He says, are you divorced? Uh, I don't remember the next thing he says. And then he says, did she beat you up? And he has that like cackle that he has. So it's a joke. It's meant to be a joke. Why? Why is it, a, why is it obviously meant to be a joke? So the woman wouldn't be a man. Yeah. That's but interesting. Not, not physically, but she seemed to be being a little different way. Sure. But, but the point I want to make to you here is when Argyle makes that joke, he's not trying to embarrass McLean or la he's trying to get him to laugh with him, right? And so the way that joke works is, hey, we both recognize this is ridiculous. The idea that she could beat you up. Am I right, big tough guy? Like prop him up uh, with the, the physical expectations of masculinity. Um, McLean doesn't really laugh because he doesn't do that at this point in the movie. Um, but here again, that's telling you a whole lot about these characters, the time and place they're in, and the sort of gendered expectations. And he's trying to bond with him over that. Like, hey man, we both, we both see the world kind of the same way, right? Uh, and I think he does it again with what he says about crawling back. Or he tries to. Cool. All right, the next scene, we're gonna, we're gonna railroad through as many of these as we can. <sighs> They're going to arrive. I don't want to say much else. Uh, there's a lot. There's a whole lot in this scene. We almost certainly will not get past this scene today. Okay? But anything you notice at all, here we go. All right, we're going to watch the rest of the scene, but I want to take a break here. Do you guys notice anything? Anything stand out as interesting, odd? He's told to be a big dog, yet he asked for Christmas music, and I feel like that's kind of soft at this point. It could be. Well, look, we can talk about that moment real quick, because there's more going on there. When McLean asks for Christmas music, I mean, we find out that's because it's like Christmas season too. So like, but then Argyle says it is Christmas music, and I don't know how well you guys can hear it in here, but like, did anybody pick out some of the lyrics? Yeah, yeah and reindeer and other shit. It's Run DMC, yeah. It's, for the time the film was made, contemporary Christmas music. But of course, when McLean says, you have any, what, what does he mean? Do you have any Christmas music? Traditional. Yes. Carols and shit, right? Um, but that word in particular, traditional, seems to carry a lot of weight, especially in the early part of this movie. What have we gone round and round about when it comes to McLean and why he's uncomfortable and, and problems he's having in his marriage? It all seems to come back to this idea of traditional. How are things supposed to be in this almost 1950s sort of way? You see what I'm saying? You can apply that to his marriage and clearly that seems to be an issue. We're gonna talk more about that next time. Um, but this is a nice little moment between these characters where they kind of ind indicate that to you with the music. Anybody in the theater would have known 
Well, this is technically Christmas music, but it's not, again, for McLean, it's not what he means when he says that. So the flip side of that conversation is, there's this whole other world, this modern world, for the film anyway, in 1988. Things are different. They're similar. Again, we're talking about Santa Claus and reindeer and all the other stuff. Um, but it's also rap, which in the 80s is new, is new, new, okay? And it, I mean, look, I'm not going out on a limb. I don't think a guy like McLean is really into Run DMC, you know? I don't think that's his jam. Um, but the point I'm making to you here is there's a whole world that's changing. Things are evolving. And it seems like he has a real problem with that. So when he says, do you have any Christmas music? He's saying he doesn't like the music. But Argyle just says, this is Christmas music. Get used to it, right? Like, I'm trying to tell him you're wrong in this regard. And my point is, you could extend that to some of the other areas we started talking about. What time is it, by the way? I'm scared. 12. Oh, sweet. I saw some of you packing up, making me nervous. Yeah. You said something about like he could live within like one house and each other. Yes. Yes. Well, um, and I, I've seen the movie like a million times, so I'll help you a little bit. Argyle says, "All right, so you walk in, music comes up, you run into each other's arms, you live happily ever after." We'll get to what McLean says. What is Argyle describing? Kind of actually, which is interesting. What some of the, I heard other. Something that's like happening in there. Yeah. But like. I'm trying to think of a way to not lead you too much. We've seen that scene. Yeah, and movies, right? Look, like, pick a Lifetime movie or like The Notebook. Somebody's always running in the rain and fucking. Right? Like, always, always, always. Um, we have stock scenes like that, and that's what Argyle is describing. This stereotypical, maybe more fairy tale, maybe more traditional idea of what the movie could be, and with what we said about McLean, McLean's like, I could live with that. I could live with that, which is even interesting. You could argue he's not saying I could thrive in that scenario. I could exist. I could. I could be okay with that scenario, the traditional scenario. And of course we learn when we get into the building uh, here in a little bit, that it's not gonna be traditional. Things are gonna get real different, real fast. Um, but that's an important moment. Uh, and then of course Argyle, uh, the way he talks about whether or not McLean is gonna score, we talked about this with all men playing basketball, that kind of language. Um, he's trying to connect to him in all these kind of ways with like man stuff. Why do you think he's doing that here? In this last moment, when they're about to go their separate ways. Why do you think he's doing that? He says it's for a tip, which I would argue is his way of like, don't cry on me, bro. Like one of those. What's he, what's he not really? Well off. Huh? It's not well off. Well, I mean, yeah, but no, that's not. The point I'm making is I would argue talking about a tip is a front here. What does he recognize about what McLean's about to do? Be a defining moment for him. Make Shit can go real sideways. He's in a place where it's pretty clear he probably doesn't know anybody. And he's going to go talk to his wife who he hasn't seen in six months. Things most assuredly aren't great. And he's like, hey man, your afternoon could get weird. I'm going to help you out. Similar to what the businessman does. He's recognizing profound weakness in this moment. But he's able, to, he's able to navigate it better than the businessman does. You see what I'm saying? He doesn't. He gives McLean an out. He's like, if you score, like he uses that language. He says, don't forget about the tip. right? He's trying to soften what could be read as recognizing McLean's weakness. Right? by even insinuating that it would tear his entire life apart if his wife leaves him tonight, right? Cool, all right, we're gonna watch the last little bit. 
I'm gonna take the very end of the scene first so we can talk about more important stuff. You don't always notice, and I'm worried about the volume in here. It's fucking menacing when he walks in. Uh, there's like a, a low hum that happens if the volume is up. Again, it's not great in this room. But he walks in and you see the iron bars behind him. You see the camera. You see a dude who is just waiting around the corner. Like there's all this um, sort of fortification and, and surveillance that was literally just around the corner. Um, and what I would argue, because I want to talk about more important things, is there's 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 something much more uh, going on behind the the facade of this building. It's not as it's not just a building, I guess I'll say. Okay, but the rest of the scene, I think you guys can do some work with that. Anything you guys notice? There's one pretty important moment. Yes, ma'am. Whoa. What does that tell us? Like, let's go ahead and get the easy one out of the way. We know what's happening. She got tired of the shit. Woo! Yeah, that would be a way to put it. It's not going well. If you are surprised with your wife choosing to go back to her maiden name, not a good sign. It's not a good sign. Right? And the way he has to find out. By the way, I don't know if you catch this, the receptionist tells him, uh, oh, 30th floor, they're the only ones left in the building. And it's like, well, we didn't have to do this, then, did we? <laughs> but it's but it's it's the way for us to find out with him. It's really slow. It's deliberate. He goes to M first because that's how you spell his name, and he's like, huh? And then he goes, G. Like we learn with him, um, so we get to experience that awful roller coaster of emotions too. We're gonna talk about this way more next time. Somebody tell me what time it is, real quick. Okay, but to start that conversation, there's some kind of low hanging fruit we could consider. What might it mean other than she's tired of the shit? Cause that's pretty clear. Um, the, the decision to go back to her maiden name. What do you guys think that is for Holly? Yeah. How so? Okay. Well, and she, I mean, she pretty much has been anyway, right? We said for six months. It's probably more like a concrete gesture for her to be like, I you, know. you could argue that. And again, I keep saying that, but like, that's an argument you could make. Given the change she makes, and bear in mind, she doesn't bother to tell him. Now, the easy argument would be, I mean, that's a guaranteed fight, right? But you could also argue, she doesn't know it to him. It's her decision about her life. Marking her independence, gaining this power. Yes, ma'am. I thought she said something about it being her job. She does that. We're going to talk about that next time. We're going to look at that scene. She tries to explain it away, which is interesting, but we'll have to wait till then. Um, so we learn it's more uh, complicated than that, potentially. But in this scene, all we know, along with McLean, is she didn't bother to tell him. She made the decision on her own. This is absolutely, potentially, a body paragraph about taking back that power in a, in a, I think you said a concrete way. Um, and we learn later on that she tries, to, I would argue she tries to backpedal a little bit. She's like, oh, God damn it, I don't want to have this fight, right? Like, especially at my job. Um, but yes, that's important. Did anybody catch what the receptionist says to him? How about the zipper? God, this is a weird thing. He's talking about the computer. He says it'll find your zipper for you if you need to take a leak. He's saying he's smart. Well, well, the comment that it's a man, him. it's a man joke. How do you know it's a man joke? Given the mechanism he's describing, yes. He's like, hey, you got a penis too, right? Like that. That's the crux of that joke. My point is, he's trying to do something similar to what Argyle did, right? You got these stupid, prove that you're a man in two seconds moments. There's a scene we're probably not gonna get, a looked at, uh, get to look at much later in the film when they uh, kill the receptionist, I believe. Um, they replace him with a, a guy with a Southern accent. And he doesn't have a lot of lines, but he's got a great one where his whole job is to pretend to be the receptionist. 
And when uh, Al comes in, he's checking the place out. He tricks him, right? What does he do? But I feel like he was watching some type of. Uh, yeah, it's a football game. Them. He's watching football on a shitty TV, and he goes, ah, I got 50 bucks on these assholes. That's it. No ID required. Because he gets his ID. He's like, oh, you're just a dude doing dude things. Cool. I'm out of here. That's all it takes. Betting on football, man. And for him to be so, like, yeah, go ahead. Like, he threw his hand, like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I don't care because I'm a guy, and I'm watching the game. I'm doing important stuff. You get it. Bro, yeah. And a similar thing is happening here. They're kind of shaking hands in this masculine way. You have your man card, I have my man card. We're both being emasculated by this machine, which is, is admittedly doing my job for me and telling you that your wife might be leaving you anyway. Yeah. So that's happening. All right, for next time. I know we're out of time because they're gone. Uh, for next time, we're going to do the same thing. Um, we're going to skip a little bit ahead. I, I told you, yeah, we're not, we're not even 11 minutes into the movie. What I want to stress to you, uh, we will talk about Holly more. We kind of have to stick to McLean today just because he is the main character. Holly's pretty important. All the characters are important. I want to tell you this too. We will not have time to talk about everything in this movie because there is so much you could potentially do. Okay? But what I want to stress to you is what you might do, I don't know, I'm not the boss of you. Um, before we meet again, especially if anything we talked about today maybe had you thinking some thoughts, you might go look at a couple scenes. See what you notice now, especially on a second viewing, especially when you watch a scene on its own. You'll be surprised what you notice when you're not just in the flow of the movie, right? Um, I want to remind you before I let you go, you have a discussion board post due and two responses. All that is, is the stuff we did today. I want you to go find a moment in a scene or something. Talk to us about it. Tell us what you think it might mean, what you think is going on, and then you guys can respond to each other. I want to try to, I want you guys to start the kind of conversation you might end up having in your paper. That's all it is. Sound good? Awesome. I'll see you then. Thank you.